Welcome to a demonstration on the three domains of life. I'd like to take a moment to talk about the differences of cells that make biologists want to group things into different categories. I really like the picture that we've got right here because it shows a lot of the domains of life. We've got eukaryotes in the form of the plants here. We've got some eukaryotes back here in the form of the people there. I'm sure there's bears and squirrels and birds and all kinds of things, insects. All of those are multicellular creatures that have cells that contain nuclei and the nucleus contains the genetic material and is surrounded by a cell membrane. We, what we can't see because they're microscopic are the individual unicellular creatures that don't have any nucleus whatsoever. And I'm sure all over the landscape and in the air and on the other creatures are bacteria, and I'm going to call those eubacteria, that's E-U bacteria, the good bacteria. And I want to distinguish them from another group called the archaea. And they're present in the form probably of all these beautifully colored um, layers in the hot pools because archaea tend to be extremophiles. They live in salty and hot and, and very extreme environments. Well, what we have in common between the archaea and the eubacteria is that neither of them has a nucleus. They don't have a membrane that separates the genetic material from the cytoplasm. And there's a temptation just to classify them as a single group, the prokaryotes. So what I want to do is talk about uh, this example I've got right here. This example has um, three, you know, rock structures that we can use as my analogy. And this pretty translucent uh, purple one, oops, pardon me, I've got a lab that I'm going to teach soon. Uh, this translucent one is going to be my eukaryotic cell. Uh, this one will be my prokaryotic cell. And this will be my archaean. And I've put them together. Maybe I should do it left to right. Actually, that's left to right to you, isn't it? Um, so I've got the most primitive, the extremophiles, the archaea there, and I've got the eukaryotes right here, and the bacteria over here. So there's a temptation to kind of say these are belong over here and the, the eukaryotes are, are, are like this. And what these have in common is that they're unicellular, they don't have a nucleus. These are usually much larger, so my model isn't very good. I should have a giant crystal over here uh, to represent my eukaryote. And they're quite distinct from each other. But if we are going to do biology on these, we might want to ask the question, how are they under the surface? If we dig in and we look at the molecular structure and the way that they handle their genomes, it could be that you notice some differences. If I were to cut open the sedimentary rock, it would be pretty much homogeneous throughout. And I'm not saying bacteria are. But when we look inside the archaea, they have certain characteristics that actually look a little bit like the eukaryotes. The eubacteria have smaller ribosomes. And the ribosomes we find in the archaea and the eukaryotes are a little bit larger and a little more sophisticated. And there are antibiotics that will kill eubacteria, but they don't have an effect on the archaea or the eukaryotes. And for that reason, there's something different in the genetic machinery. And likewise, there's almost never an intron. I've never heard of an intron in a, in a, a eubacteria cell. But in the archaea, there are some introns. And in the eukaryotes, there's lots of introns. In fact, most genes are more intron than exon. So we start to see that there are some similarities that allow us to group them. Well, how that fits well with um, a view of evolution is this kind of a diagram. And I, I've attributed it here for a public domain work. I got that off of U uh, Wikipedia, as I did with the other. And what we have are groupings that kind of fit with some of the characteristics I, I pointed out, that the bacteria are, they don't have a nucleus, but they also have peptidoglycan in their cell wall. And that's a special molecule that's more or less unique to what we see happening in the uh, eubacteria. We don't find it in the archaea, even though they're single-celled, non-nucleated uh, creatures. We notice that the ribosomes are more similar between archaea and eukaryotes, and so we can kind of group them together, and that's what a diagram like this does. We've got a black line here representing LUCA, and LUCA is the last universal common ancestor. And that's split into various groups. Oh, and let me just fix this right here. Bacteria is actually eubacteria. That's what I've been calling them. That's the more accepted current name. And this group diverged from this ancestral line. And this ancestral line gave rise to both the archaea and the eukaryotes. So we can probably assume that a creature here had introns, had more sophisticated ribosomes, had a lot of the features that these both hold in common. And so you can see that although archaea are very distinct from eukaryotes, and superficially resembled the eubacteria, when we start to look at the genetics and the molecular structure, they are more different from each other 
than the archaea are from the eukaryotes. So it's a complicated topic for some students and hopefully this was uh, somewhat useful for you.